pictures, um, as expected. Um, as Carolyn had mentioned, I have spent quite a bit of time in Oman. Um, I started in 2007-2008 when I was a Fulbright research fellow. And my original project was supposed to be about women, women's organizations in Oman, and I met the director of the Center for Oman Dress, and that's when it all started. We went into her very, she had her collection in her home, and we, every week, we'd go into her home, and on the kitchen table, clear it out, and start cataloging dresses that she had collected from all over the country, um, and brought into this private collection, which is actually now, very recently, put as part of the Beit al Zubair uh, Museum, Complex. I don't know if um, any of you are familiar with Oman or Muscat, um, but Beit Isbir is one of the top private museums there showcasing culture and heritage of Oman. Um, as Carolyn also mentioned, between my time in Oman um, and my time here now, between that I did spend time here at the LMEI as a research fellow, again um, doing some research on textiles in Saudi Arabia. Um, and now I'm at the British Museum, I'm working on a consultancy project with the United Arab Emirates, and Although the work goes beyond dress and textiles, it goes into culture and heritage generally, um, material culture is still such a big part of this part of the world. And it's quite, it's really unique. And um, I'm glad that you all came this evening um, to speak about it. Um, everywhere wears clothes. <laughs> um, clothing and identity is very important in cultures all around the world. Um, and it, it's just a non-verbal way of communicating and it communicates on so many levels. So my uh, talk this evening focuses on dress and identity in Oman, and it's an edited version, actually, of a forthcoming article um, coming in 2017 to be published in the Freer and Sackler Journal, um, the Smithsonian Journal, Ars Orientalis, um, on recent research in Asia. Um, the article focuses specifically on men's national dress and national identity, so those subjects will um, be talked about a bit more this evening, but I'll also um, expand the discussion into women's dress. Uh, my aim this evening is to illuminate how, many how the elements of Omani dress for men and women are physical <coughs> pieces of evidence of the country's long history of trade and, trade and interaction across the Indian Ocean. This history is important to how Omanis construct this uh, narrative of national identity. They claim distinction from their Gulf neighbors in this way. So men's dress symbolizes and embodies Omani national identity. And women's dress, on the other hand, has evolved to include Western-style modest dress and the ubiquitous, uh, fashionable, modern abaya that we see today. The traditional styles are quite diverse throughout the different regions of Oman, and they also indicate these transnational connections and influences. So all of these materials, the colors, the textures, the shapes, the styles of both men and women's dress tell us stories of the people who wore it and also the people who made it. We learn about how materials and styles are locally produced or have they been imported, and how these elements and details have evolved into modern trends of modern Omanis today. So that's just generally the outline of this evening. I'll try to keep it short because I can talk for hours about this, <laughs> but I will say I'll make it short and sweet and then we can um, have discussion and questions after. Um, for those of you who may not know where Oman is, um, it is the easternmost country in the Arab Middle East, and its history has closely um, been tied with maritime trade routes of the Indian Ocean and throughout all the coastal communities there um, since time immemorial, pretty much. With the exception of brief occupations by the Persians and the Portuguese, Oman has remained independent of foreign rule since 1650. In the mid-19th century, the Sultanate of Muscat and Oman, as it was called then, uh, was at its apex as a trading empire. The territories included a large portion of the East African coast and the Makran coast, which is now part of modern-day Pakistan and Iran. In 1832, Sultan Said, um, seen here, he moved his court to Zanzibar and encouraged, encouraged Omanis to settle there. This created a new, whole new Arab elite community in the East African coast. While Sultan Said's sons eventually split the empire between Zanzibar and Muscat, the movement of people, goods, and style influences between Africa and Arabia still continue today. So Oman also has maintained connections with South Asia. Baluchis are the largest non-Arab community in northern Oman, originating from the Makran coast. In the 17th and 18th centuries, Baluchis were recruited as mercenaries for the Imams of the interior, 
and they still maintain a considerable portion or considerable presence in the military and police force today. Hindus from Gujarat have also been in northern Oman since about the 15th century, and Banyan and Lawatiya groups had considerable economic influence during Oman's initial 18th century expansion into Africa. Many Baluchis and Lawatis continue to speak their respective languages, much like Omani Zanzibari still speak Swahili as well as Arabic and English. So there's been a, a whole lot of other groups who have settled in Oman's northern coast, including Shia Persians, Ismailis, and other Hindu Indians. Many have been granted Omani citizenship as well, and the southern coast also has relations with the Horn of Africa and East Africa, as well as neighboring Yemen. So all of these historic Indian Ocean connections are integral to the social history of Oman's neighbors as well. These transnational merchants of Arab, Persian, or Indian descent have been active in settling in port cities throughout the Gulf for centuries. It is only in the latter half of the 20th century that a person's regional or ethnic origin was recognized um, as an important marker of his identity. The impact of oil discovery and wealth combined with increased Western influences, such as the British pulling out of the Gulf in the early 1970s, as well as the formation of the Gulf Cooperation Council in 1981, all of these factors within the last half of the century, all of them contributed to this, the Gulf citizens feeling this need to reassert this, re this united Gulf or Khaliji identity. This meant distinguishing citizens from non-citizens and nationals from each of the different states from each other. And the most visible product of that that we can see is the wearing of national dress. In Oman, men wear the white dishdasha and the printed masar, supported by the kumma. Uh, the uni this uniform of sorts has become a bit ubiquitous. It distinguishes uh, the Omani citizen from the non-citizen, and it also distinguishes Omanis from other um, Gulf citizens in the region. We can clearly see the African influences in the Kuma, the Indian through the Masar, and the Arab through the Dishdasha. So the Dishdasha is this robe here. Um, the Kuma, the man in the middle, is wearing the cap, and the Masar is the tied um, head cloth around the head. I'll explain a little bit more about it, each of those elements um, as we go along. So all of these different elements, um, they combined together to create this distinct cultural biography of the modern national dress. So this is another example. You can see these are, um, this is quite formal dress, and they're wearing white dishnashes, as you see, um, and underneath their masar, they usually wear a comb underneath to keep it, you know, a nice, clean, and neat appearance. And this was, this photograph was taken at the camel race, in the interior, and it was quite an official occasion. It was like the finals or something. And these are local officials, and they're indicating their status and the fact that it's an official event through the wearing of the khanjar, as well as having very neat masars. So Omani men working in the public sector are required to wear the white dishdasha. However, those working in the private sector can choose to wear white or other neutral colors. Bolder and brighter colors that we can see a little bit of in this picture it's not just white, we've got some blues and tans as well. Um, bolder and brighter colors, such as indigo, dark green, and pastel colors, are also worn for varying occasions, as you can see here. Um, embroidery in satin and cotton threads um, decorate the neckline, which is called a maha, right here. And down the front, about halfway down the chest, which is called a shak, that bit right there. Um, it's sometimes it's around the wrist, sometimes it's not, depending on the discretion, depending on a person's preference. And the tassel, the faracha, often um, is included as part of the discretion. It's held together with a button, and that is usually perfumed very nicely. Um, let's see. And underneath the discretion, you can't really tell, except for this guy, men wear um, the wazad, which is actually a hip cloth worn around the waist. Um, and you can just see in his underwear. And the kuma, as you see there, it's a colorfully embroidered, brimless brown cap. It can be worn on its own um, or worn underneath um, the masar, as we saw in the, um, in the previous photo over there. And um, the masars are usually these large square head cloths that you fold in half into a triangle and then fold it expertly and neatly around your head or around the kuma in a turban style. So we see the wazar and the head coverings are testament to Oman's maritime past and transnational connections. 
The bazaar is, or variations of it, is called many different names in coastal areas throughout the Indian Ocean. The head coverings are obviously a bit more visible. The masar is still um, imported from Kashmir, and the kumma um, has Zanzibari origins. The men who usually wore the kumma in the recent past formally indicated his connections to East Africa. So here we can see, clearly see, how Oman difference, Omani dress is different from other Arab Gulf states' dress. The cut, of the, uh, the cut and the style of the dishnasha is quite unique to Southeast Arabia. Um, here, we've got um, Emirati kanjuras, actually. The similar garment to the dishnasha is worn in the neighboring UAE, where they call it a kanjura, but oftentimes they have a very long tassel. You can may barely make it up, but he's got this very long tassel slung over his shoulder, or they may not have a tassel at all. Um, so the dishdasha and the kanjura, they both kind of fall in a straight A-line cut down to the ankles. They have wide sleeves and are quite loose around the middle, and they're um, always, well, always, they're colorless, and they have the tassel, and they don't have the tassel. By contrast, as we see here, I think this is taken in Dubai, um, other, other dress, or the, the white robe worn in the other Gulf states is called fold first of all, and it resembles a longer version of the Western man's dress shirt, as we can see here. We've got collars of different types. We can see a pocket square. Um, some men have uh, cufflinks with theirs as well. And underneath, instead of wearing the wazar or hip cloth, um, men wear the white sidwall or trousers. And in terms of head coverings, we can see here, the other countries of the Gulf, they wear a smaller white skull cap known as a kafir or tagia. And over top is another large square headcloth, more are folded into a triangle, but instead draped over the head. So the white one up here is known as a gudra, and then the red and white checkered ones are known as shmag. And on top of those, they wear the black, the double looped black egal. In the UAE, we see that the white lutra can be wrapped around the head in a turban style, much like the Omani Masar. However, it is usually just wrapped freestyle without the aid of a kuma to give it some shape. Um, this style of tying and wrapping a head cloth is known as the imama style, possibly named after the dis distinctive style of how imams in the region used to wear their white head cloth around a pillbox around their heads. So this style existed in the Arabian Peninsula and the Ottoman Empire, but faded as colonialism and 20th century fashion trends spread throughout the region. And as far as I know, Oman is the only country in the Arabian Peninsula today to continue using this historical style and promote it as part of their national dress. We can't mention Oman without mentioning Sultan Qaboos. Um, he plays a significant role as a creator and leader of modern Omani national identity. You can't escape the ever-present image of the benevolent monarch prominently displayed in public buildings, private homes, on the highway, during National Day, on cars, everywhere. So most, port most portraits of the Sultan include him in full court dress. So we see him in the white pistachio, um, as well as the embellished black bisht overrobe. Um, and then, you can hardly see it as well, there's the, the royal hunter that he wears at his waist, and on top he wears the royal turban. In official portraits and media appearances, the Sultan's appearance has been very consistent. His public image clearly influences dress habits of Omani men, further reinventing or at least reasserting the specific dress tradition. It also shows a bit of historical accuracy, accuracy and continuity. So this archive photograph shows Sultan Hamad bin Thuwaini of Zanzibar in 1891. Much of the Arab elite in Zanzibar would have worn dress quite similar to this, and we can see that there isn't really much difference in the current sultan's appearance. Um, it doesn't really stray much from the styles of its predecessors over a century ago. While Oman and Zanzibar are now separate political entities, we cannot deny what we see in these visual evidence of dress, that these historic connections still play an important part of Omani national, in Omani national identity. Getting down to the details here. Um, as I mentioned before, the kumma, or this colorfully embroidered cap, has origins in East Africa. Oman is the only country in the Arab Middle East to incorporate this style of head covering as part of its national dress. Each man has a signature style of wearing the kumma, 
and his Masar on top as well. And usually it's developed when you're a young schoolboy because all young Omani men are required to wear the national dress to school. For work and other formal occasions, the kuma is often worn underneath the Masar to give it a neat shape, as I mentioned before. In East Africa, the kuma is known as kofia. It's made of two parts, um, the kofia and the kuma, a circular top that sits on the wearer's head, um, which is called a hafi in Swahili, and a rounded lower, which is known as mashhadari mish in Swahili. Um, don't really know Swahili, so. <laughs> um, so the rounded lower wraps around the head, and both parts are embroidered separately using an eyelet filling embroidery technique and then stitched together. The kuma has gained prominence as part of Oman's national dress in the last about 20 to 30 years, and virtually every man and boy now wears the kuma on a regular basis. A couple more images. That's at the Muscat Festival a few years back. And that's one of the, um, in the Muscat Festival, they also have Omani women showcasing their craft skills, and one of them is embroidering the kuma. So those are the bottom halves that wrap around the head. So you can see the variety of styles and colors that we have there. Throughout the 19th century, tribes mainly from Oman Sharkia, or Eastern region, and the central city of Rustak formed a new Omani Arab diaspora community in Zanzibar and other port cities of East Africa. The Rishu, as it was known in Zanzibar, was a long white garment similar to the Dishnasha, and the Joho jacket was a, a black overcoat similar to what we know now as the Bish in Arabia. The turbans were known as kilemba, uh, which is similar to the wrap from the sar, and the daggers there were known as jambia, um, or today in Oman, known as khanjar. So this new elite grew economically and socially prosperous over many generations in Zanzibar, in what can be known as the Swahilization of Omani Arabs. But after the African nationalist movements in 1964, and Sultan Qaboos coming into power in 1970, Zanzibari Omanis returned and settled back in their ancestral home, maintaining their culture, their customs, including the Swahili language, food, celebrations, and dress traditions, such as the kofia, which is now known as the kuma. So these are selections of kumas on sale in Muscat Suit. This is only one shop. There are several shops. You can just see the variety, and they just, they just pack the shelves. So that's uh, so, um, an Arab man in Zanzibar wearing quite similar dress. Again, you can see the historical continuity somewhat today. And these are a selection of Zanzibari kofias in the British Museum collection. And the top left here was actually embroidered in 1920. So there is virtually no difference between Zanzibari kofias and Omani kumas. So in Zanzibar, uh, men have been traditionally responsible for embroidering the kofia, and in Oman, kumas today are stitched by machine or handmade by both expatriates and Omani women. Indian and Filipino kuma makers use lower quality <coughs> thread, um, while those embroidered by Omani women use higher quality thread and take more time to manufacture. To an untrained eye and touch, it is difficult to distinguish a hand embroidered kuma from, from a machine embroidered one. Shopkeepers are keen to mention that the latter is slightly stiffer at first handling than the former. Um, some of the high quality machine stitched kumas can appear hand embroidered, which can be a great bargain. And in terms of pricing, they range from five to 50 Omani reals, which is, I'm trying to think of the exchange rate, about 10 to 100 pounds. I'm not quite sure if that's correct, but. We can look that up later. <laughs> so they, there's, there's quite a range. You can have your everyday kumas, you can have your special kumas, that sort of thing. And so these kumas are um, also in the British Museum collection, direct from Oman, 20th century. Um, the one on the left was actually machine embroidered in either India or the Philippines and imported into Oman in the early 21st century, actually. So this lovely photo shows a man coordinating the bright colors of his masar to the embellishments on his dishnasha. And many fashion-conscious men in urban Muscat often match the colored embroidery of the dishnasha and tassel with that of his masar or his kuma or gold. So the minute details that we see here of embroidery patterns may be different for each white dishnasha that a man might own. When he orders a new dishnasha to be made at the tailor in the souk or he goes to the mall, he can pick a generic size and the tailor brings out a sample book in which he can pick out the 
a pattern or color of all the different um, styles um, and threads with which he can purchase or his personalize his nudist fashion. So for example, if a man has a kuma with blue and green embroidery, he can choose to have two different dispatches to coordinate with it. You can see lovely bright colors. Doesn't shy away from colors. <laughs> Matrasuk shopkeepers hold an impressive variety of color combinations and patterns for modern kumas and masars. They sell the highest quality masars imported directly from Kashmir, made of the finest wool with detailed hand-embroidered embellishments alongside less expensive ones of lesser quality, both polyester or cotton or blend, um, which are also produced in Kashmir or they're produced locally and with less detailed embroidery. Masars themselves um, can be quite pricey and they can range between costing four rials to 300 rials. It's actually quite a practical piece of clothing. Wool, um, although you think you're in a hot climate, wool can be that um, forgiving, but it is quite a good insulator against both the heat and the cold, and cashmere wool is the best quality made available throughout the country. There are many ways of folding and styling and tying the masar around a man's head, and regional styles have emerged over the past few decades. A popular style that many men working in the public sector in Muscat and throughout the rest of the country wear as part of their uniform is tying the masar around the kuma, that everybody seems to do that, um, especially if you're a working man. And um, so they're tied around their heads, the masar covers their ears, and we use a small triangular piece of cloth hanging at the, at the nape of your neck. Religiously observant men and imams tend to wear a plain white masar without a kuma underneath. And men from the city of Sur, as we see here, this is a performing group from Sur at Muscat Festival. Um, they wear the masar folded three times at the forehead without covering the ears. You can see, you clearly see their ears. Um, and the triangular piece of the nape can be folded back into the wrap or it can be left long and hanging. Dofari styles in the south of the country, um, they often wear a checkered masar with tassels at the end and wrapped around the head um, and then sometimes there's a piece draping on the shoulder or folded back on top of the head. So going on to women's dress. So we've seen how Men's garments show the nuanced details in colors and patterns, and how they distinguish somebody's personal taste as well as his national identity. Women's traditional dress reflects, also reflects the country's geographical and cultural diversity, with a variety of dress styles for each of Oman's eight regions and governorates. They all use different colors, different fabrics, and different styles of head, head and body coverings, embroidery, and other embellishments. We again see more apparent influences from both Africa and South Asia with the use of specific garments such as the kanga and the combination of knee-length tunic with trousers. The basic outfit, which we can see here, this is, I think, from um, Niswa or around central Oman. Uh, the basic outfit is also the dishtasha, which is the main garment there. Unlike the men's versions, women's dishtashas are never white. They're usually uh, knee length, although in some regions and cities they can reach the calves or they can reach your ankles as well. They're made of a, of a variety of colors and fabric styles, and the decorations are usually on the chest area, the neckline of the chest, on the sleeve cuffs, as well as the bottom, and they can be quite um, really heavy embellishments, um, depending again on where you are in the country and the occasion for which you're wearing um, these garments. Underneath the dishtasha, women wear the sirwal, trousers as well. Um, they're loose around the upper legs and then they taper to fit really close at the ankles. Um, like the dishtasha, they can be made of a variety of fabrics and embellishments. And sometimes, I don't have a picture, I wish I'd put the picture up, but um, since this part of the sirwal is covered by the dishtasha, they can often be made of scraps of fabric. Um, so you get all sorts of random fabrics, and then when you hit the bottom half of the sirwal, they're very nice fabric, because that's the part you show off. Um, the ankle cuffs are also embellished with colorful thread embroidery here, and sometimes, again, they can be really thick and really dense, depending on where you are in the country. Um, in terms of head coverings, again, there's a variety of them. Uh, the wakaya and the lesu are usually large enough to wrap around both the head and the body and they can be further embellished with a fringing of yarn at the edges. The shela, the lahaf, and the kanga are rectangular in shape and usually without fringing, although it depends on a woman's taste whether or not they want to add these embellishments. Um, and they're usually made of plain or printed textiles. 
The shalas in the house are usually smaller and wrap around the head only, and the kanga can be larger, covering both the head and the body. And this is quite an interesting um, picture here. This is from the center of Rome for a mind dress, and it's using kanga fabric as fabric for Yudhishtasha. Uh, the kanga, as mentioned before, has clear connections with East Africa and features a Swahili saying underneath a large graphic print. So this kanga is actually from Zanzibar in the BM collection. Um, women who wear the kanga may have direct or indirect family connections with Zanzibar or other East um, African coastal communities. And in Muscat, in the capital region, uh, foreign communities are also distinguishable through women's dress. The Baluchi style in this photo clearly resembles style wor styles worn in southwestern Pakistan and southeastern Iran. The shadar here it drapes across or um, over the face and head and the body. Um, and it matches the rest of the outfit. So unlike the riot of colors and color combinations here, they usually, the, the three elements here usually match. Um, the distress of here is known as the pash, and it extends below the knees and embroidered in four main areas. So the sleeves, which you can't see underneath the shadow, but the chest area and a unique triangular shape here. And it's actually quite um, practical now when they embroider it. It's usually a little poppy, you can stick your mobile phone keys anything that a woman needs, doesn't need to carry a handbag. <laughs> um, see. So in the Luwati Nishtasha on this side, again from the BM collections, um, it comes up to mid-calf length, um, and it's made instead of a solid, more solid colored fabric, and you can tell here it's really heavily embellished. You can see the thickness of the, um, the metal threads here, and the cuffs, and on the chest, and clearly it was made for um, wearing a special occasion, like a wedding or Eid celebration as well. And just to show you the similarities, this is taken in Pakistan. So these are Baluchi dresses in Pakistan, and very, I mean, they're obviously more densely embroidered than the one that we see here from Oman, but they're very similar. Another clear example of connections to India include a specific satin type fabric with colorful vertical stripes that are used for garments in the city of Sur, which is in the far northeastern um, part of Oman and face of the Indian Ocean. It's known as Suri silk, um, and it's, it's not actually silk, I don't think, but it's what they call it. Um, and it's said to be based on a fabric from Gujarat um, in northwestern India. So I hope this short introduction, very short introduction, I, like I said, I can talk for ages about it, but it gives you a little bit of a taste um, on how the cultural biography, this cultural authentication process, and the social life of Omani dress and identity um, is displayed in modern Oman today. There are countless more examples of regional traditional styles of women's dress, um, but unlike men's dress, there's a lot more written and a lot more research in women's dress, there's actual publications. Whereas men's dress, in any sort of dress studies throughout the world, I think it's quite an understudied um, part of um, clothing and dress studies. So we can see how the social life of both men and women's dress is influenced by the individual wearer's choices, as well as um, the cultural and historical connections of Oman in history. So the cultural biography of men's national dress shows how the elements of the Dishdasha, the Koma, and the Masar have their own cultural context and background, with influences from Arabia, Africa, and South Asia. The cultural authentication process occurs when these disparate elements with their individual identities are combined together as they do in Omani national dress. They put together the separate meanings and histories and then they transform them into something that we can call uniquely Omani. That's all I have for this evening. Um, any questions, comments, discussion?